In today's tutorial, we're going to make a block mold, a cut block mold using 5150 silicone. Now, 5150 is a platinum system. It's a one-to-one -one mix ratio, 50 Shore A platinum silicone that's great for making these really firm cut block molds like this. Now, this could also be used for a more traditional two-piece mold with a clay parting line. But in this tutorial, we're going to keep it fairly simple and just cut this into two halves and make a very simple, straightforward cut block mold. And of course, we'll wrap it up by casting some TC-808 jet black casting resin into said mold. And look at that minimal flashing. Now to begin, 5150 is of course a one-to-one -one mix ratio, 50 Shore A platinum silicone. Now what that means is we have to be very careful about potential contaminants. And anytime you're working with a platinum system, you want to make sure that your pattern and anything that comes in contact with is not contaminated or won't contaminate the platinum. And when in doubt, you can always call us and check and see if it's something we've encountered before. But there's always that chance you might be molding something something that uh, no one's ever molded before. And in that case, the best thing to do is mix up a small batch of silicone and put it on the pattern surface and test it to see if it's going to inhibit the silicone. Now we're going to secure this with some hot glue and use one of our mold tubes. And a quick word about hot glue. The best hot glue I've found is actually just the generic hot glue from Hobby Lobby. And we're now going to release our mold tube and our pattern using some of the Zip 301 mold release. Real important, this mold release does not contain silicone oil. Silicone oil can either contaminate the mold or cause the uh, silicone to bond to the pattern, which is, of course, bad. Now we need to calculate the volume on our cylinder. Now this is a pretty standard volume formula. We want to determine the cubic inch volume and then figure out how much silicone we need by the pound. So we're going to take uh, pi 3.14 times radius squared times height, and which is going to give us about uh, 32 or 33 cubic inches of silicone. Now this particular silicone formula on the data sheet, you'll see this one is about just shy of 24 cubic inches per pound. So that's gonna use a little less than 1.5 pounds of silicone. And now let's go over the properties of the 5150 platinum silicone. Of course, it's platinum. So obviously we wanna be careful there about any kind of cure inhibition, but this cures to a very firm 50 Shore A silicone. Has a 30 to 40 minute working time and a three to four hour demold at room temperature. And of course, for a silicone, especially one this hard, it has a relatively low mixed viscosity of 9,100 centipoise. And of course, it's colorless translucent which of course means we can do a lot more with this uh, than just make molds. This is also a good silicone for casting silicone parts. We have a lot of our customers that uh, use this to prototype silicone parts. And then of course they can pigment this to whatever color they want. Now, anytime I'm making a mold like this, I usually convert whatever I need in pounds over to grams because it, the math is so much easier. So this was about 1.3 uh, pounds of silicone. And when I converted that over into grams, I wound up uh, using about a little over 600 grams total. I think I did about 310 grams of part A and 310 grams of part B. So not all of a two pound kit, Still had a little over a half a pound left. And now we're ready to mix up our silicone and, of course, vacuum degas it. And you'll see here the main thing with any silicone like this, especially a thick formula, you want to make sure you take care to really scrape the sides and the bottom of the mixing bucket. Uh, you want to make sure you get that all incorporated really well into that mixture. And you notice also that, that even though this is a relatively small batch of just about 620 grams, that I have a, a fairly large mixing cup because when I subject this to a vacuum, it's going to expand quite a bit. And I went ahead and left in pretty much the entire mixing process in here just to show you how long that typically takes. So even with thorough mixing, this still just took right around a minute of mixing. Now with a 30 minute working time, we have more than enough time to vacuum degas this properly. 
So just make sure you have a vacuum pump that uh, is well matched for your vacuum chamber and that allows you to get this done pretty fast. We have a about a two and a half gallon pot here and a six CFM vacuum pump. And that's a great combination for this. We're able to evacuate all of the air out of that pot pretty quick. And what we're looking for is that silicone to rise and then break and fall. So typically on this, it doesn't take long for that to happen. You'll see it almost jumps out of the bucket here, comes up and then starts to collapse and go back down. And as soon as it does that, as soon as it goes back down, usually let it go for a little bit longer. But uh, just remember, a lot of that undulating will continue for a while. But as soon as the main thing you're looking for when you're degassing is that rise and collapse. And once that drops back down, you're ready to ease off that, uh, let the air back into the chamber and pull that out. And now we have a nice, dense, bubble-free silicone ready to pour over our pattern. And one of the things, again, one of those little bit of housekeeping things for a poured mold like this, always a good idea to make sure you're pouring in one spot and let the silicone seek its level. And one thing you'll see me do here is I tilt this back a little bit because of that ridge right around the edge of that chest piece. Um, that's an area that could uh, catch void or some air bubbles underneath it, even with vacuum degas silicone. So I tilt it up as a, at an angle to let that silicone fill up underneath and not create any kind of voids. Now, whatever is left over in the mixing bucket, always leave that alone because that's a good test of whatever is going on inside your mold. So this is about four or five hours later, and we're going to test that drip, and we see that secured nice and strong, so we're ready to open up our mold. But real important on that, uh, always keep uh, a drip of the silicone or your mixing bucket or something to check that so you don't accidentally stick your finger in or try to open up a mold before it's fully set. Especially right now when the weather's cold and my shop's a little bit on the cold side, I always like to make absolute sure that everything is completely cured before I go to start opening up a mold. Now, because this is a block mold, I'm going to cut this open using a kind of a zigzag pattern or kind of a zipper pattern. And what that's going to do is create kind of a uh, crude key form in the sides of the mold. So I'm going to cut this roughly into halves. And you see me going there with the uh, X-Acto or the scalpel blade uh, back and forth in that S pattern. And the reason I'm doing that S instead of a hard zigzag line is uh, those curves are much harder to form a tear. So always a good idea to make sure you do that more of an S curve and keep that fairly tight than doing a real abrupt zigzag cut. And now ready to cut the rest of the mold in half. And we now have a nice dense two-piece mold and because we're using that really firm 50 shore a that'll give us a really clean parting line that's the main advantage to this if we're making two or three or even four piece molds that all have to get together and and produce a nice precision part we want that to be able to be pressed together without distorting that seam and that's where really hard rubber like this comes in handy now to secure these two halves together, you could either use some rubber bands or for this particular video, I had some uh, friction tape or some electrical tape handy. So I just used that to tape the, up the mold and now ready for some casting. And just to demonstrate that nice tight seam, I decided we'd cast some TC-808 I had sitting around the shop. And TC-808 is available in both the standard white formula and the jet black formula. And here I want to do the jet black formula for my little chest piece here. And this, of course, is mixed one-to-one -one by weight. And this formula, the 808, is a fairly fast-setting formula. So this is great for small parts where you need a fast turnaround time. And the 808 has some great physical properties. It's also, it's a very hard resin, but it's not a brittle resin. And that's a real important uh, detail, especially if you're making aftermarket automotive parts or uh, you know any kind of thin parts, thin-walled electronic parts or anything like that. Now, what I was pointing out there is there's that little ridge on that pawn, and I want to make sure that doesn't trap air bubbles. So what I'm doing is tilting that and pouring it out of the mold to make sure I don't trap any air bubbles in that. Makes it a little messy, but uh, that ensures we don't have air bubbles in that ridge. And now I'm ready to fill it up the rest of the way. 
Now, anytime I'm molding a part like this, you never know on that first cast uh, what your usage is going to be on material exactly. So I always like to have some other small molds sitting around. So I'm going to pour up an extra one of our little resin nuts. And then one of the more interesting little widgets we have to cast around our shop is uh, a little part from my late father-in-law. This was a little medallion from his days as a pharmacist of a, looks like a, suspiciously like a mad scientist. And you'll see I'm using my, of course, gloved finger here to rub that resin into the detail. Real important. Obviously, you want to wear a glove for that. But you'll see in a minute that makes a big difference in getting really good detail on a small part like this without having to use a pressure chamber. Now, this is, a again, a fast-setting resin, so as soon as some of those little drips in areas or whatever's left over in the mixing cup is set up, we're ready to demold that. And we've covered this in previous videos, but it's always important to remember that thin cross-section parts will take longer to set up than these thick, chunky parts. So like this little medallion here, you'll see this is still fairly green. So it's the exact opposite of an air drying material. And that's really important to remember, especially if you're casting parts that have both, that have like a thick base and then the taper to a point. You want to make really sure that uh, you're giving that time for that thinnest cross-section to cure completely before you try to demold because one of the saddest things ever is to try to demold something too early and ruin an otherwise perfect part. So there is our part, our little chess piece. And at this stage, when it's uh, fairly green before it's solidified completely, this is a good time to clean up any flashing like here around the base and any little sanding work that we need to do, any bubble removal, which thankfully we don't have any, but uh, this is the time where we want to remove that. And there we have our cast parts. And you'll see here in a second the detail on that medallion. Um, I like to think that that's Leechman in his days before his uh, transition to uh, Leechman. So there you have the process of making a firm 5150 silicone block mold, a cut block mold, and of course a TC-808 jet black cast. And as always, all of the materials we show in our videos are available on our website. So the 5150 silicone as well as the TC-808 at brickintheyard.com. And as usual, I'll put the links to the products we use in our video in the video description. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when we turn out new content. Thanks again for watching.